on behalf of the department of physics scottish church college i welcome you all uh, to the webinar to celebrate 100 years of einstein to uh, sorry nobel prize to einstein uh, i request our principal madam dr madhumanjuri mondol to inaugurate the session खुब डिस्टार्ब हम डिस्टार्बिंग मैडम we cannot hear you properly actually uh, uh what should i do now actually now it is clear it is better am i audible now now yes. you are audible so you you can uh, continue so can i is it is, is it no okay. madhu madhu there okay, is okay thank you thank you there is interruption in between yeah maybe due to that uh, this internet problem i don't know but it uh, i'm uh, unmuted and uh, it is showing that uh, both the video and uh, so should i can actually some of uh, some of you are not muted so please mute yourself joita please mute yourself okay let me continue am i audible now supratim da okay unmuted sorry for the interruption our honorable speaker today professor polash poron pal emeritus professor department of physics university of calcutta our vice principal Dr. Shupratim Das, Internal Quality Assurance Cell Coordinator, Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharji, mm -hmm. head of the, head of the department physics, Dr. Joyita Choudhury, honorable colleagues, distinguished guests, and beloved students. On behalf of Scottish Church College family, I welcome you all today. in this webinar entitled einstein and the nobel prize today we have gathered here to celebrate the centenary year of awarding the nobel prize to sir einstein to know about this particular nobel prize and about the recipient of the prize <laughs> सुशोभन एक्चुअली व्हाट्स द प्रॉब्लम प्रिंसिपल इज गेटिंग म्यूटेड जस्ट लाइक द अदर डे व्हेन सुरंजन दास वाज हिज स्पीकर यू रिमेंबर हाँ सर उन्हर मैंने उन्हर समस्या हो चुकी चु सर ओके नाउ आई थिंक आई एम ऑडिबल यस यू आर ऑडिबल नाउ व्हेन द स्टोरी टेलर इज 
Professor Paulash Baran Pal, uh, who is not uh, who is not only a physicist but also a writer. a linguist and a poet. It will be really interesting to listen to this uh, story of the sentinel. Uh, his contribution, Professor Paula shines by writing popular science uh, literature in Bengali is remarkable. He has won many prizes or awards like Rovindra Sriti Puroshkar in 2004 and Ramindra Sundar uh, Sriti Puroshkar in 2011. We are very fortunate enough to have him amongst us today. We convey our deep gratitude from the bottom of our heart as he has given us the time from his busy schedule today. I also want to congratulate to the uh, department, especially to HOD Physics and the IQAC coordinator for organizing such meaningful and interesting baby really eagerly waiting to listen to you, sir. May God bless all of us and bless our institution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Now I request our vice principal, sir, to say a few words. A very good afternoon. And uh, once again, after the principal, I most cordially welcome our speaker, Professor Dr. Paul Ashwaran Pal, who is uh, not a new one to us because uh, already we had him in our college when he came here to deliver the Alexander Duff Memorial Lecture. That was an excellent lecture on the history and mystery of calendars. So most welcome, sir, to our college once again. Uh, today's lecture is uh, really interesting because uh, Einstein, uh, definitely he, about him, we have uh, a lot of, uh, a good measure of inquisitiveness, particularly because of the very intimate connection of uh, Einstein and some of the contemporary very powerful minds. We know that uh, Einstein had very, uh, warm relation and he was in regular uh, correspondence uh, with uh, Rabindranath Tagore, Mohandas Gandhi and then Jawaharlal Nehru. And in fact, uh, Rabindranath met uh, Einstein, if I'm not wrong, at least three times. And uh, really they had very serious discussions and Professor Uma Dasgupta has shown us how uh, there were exchanges uh, through correspondence between uh, Rabindranath and uh, Einstein uh, on so many occasions. And in fact, uh, Rabindranath uh, treated Einstein not just uh, as a scientist, but uh, as a philosopher also. Uh, that is a person with a, a philosophical mind. And uh, from uh, Abraham Pease, from the writings of Abraham Pease, one of the uh, eminent biographers of Einstein, uh, we come to know that, uh, in fact, Einstein had a, uh, had a profound respect for Indian tradition. And uh, he, he really was one of the, uh, one of the, most important, one of the most uh, well-known admirers of Gandhi. And uh, really uh, Einstein also uh, contributed uh, a lot to the lofty idea of uh, Gandhian uh, mass movement and particularly 
uh, when he was requested by some of the Indians to uh, go on a hunger strike uh, to, to, as, as a protest against uh, the, 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 the making of the uh, hydrogen bomb, uh, Einstein said that it will be effective in India. I'm not disrespectful to the Gandhian method, but it will not be uh, effective in the United States where it will be accepted as uh, a, a, a direct challenge to the government. Now, uh, so uh, really we find a very uh, colorful character uh, in Einstein uh, as, as Indians. And uh, I would not take uh, any more time, but I have just uh, two questions. I think uh, Professor Paul will particularly address uh, those uh, uh, two important things. Uh, number one is, uh, why did the Swedish uh, Nobel Committee uh, for Physics wait so long before giving Einstein the prize? And uh, secondly, uh, why did they not award it for relativity? We know that uh, Einstein was uh, uh, given the Nobel Prize for photoelectric effects and not for physics, uh, uh, sorry, for, not for uh, relativity. It was given uh, for physics, but not for relativity. Uh, uh, was it too early? Uh, was there, uh, in fact, at that time, not a very competent person to, to assess this in advance, the Einstein's theory of relativity? So I, I am sure uh, Professor Paul will discuss uh, all these things, and uh, I will be uh, eagerly uh, looking forward to hear from him. Uh, with these few words, uh, I welcome the speaker and all the others once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now the technical session. All of us are eagerly waiting to hear from Professor Polash Poron Pal. Sir, please start. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir, clearly. Okay. Can you also see me? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Two successes. Okay, first of all, I thank you. When I say thank you, I mean Scottish Church College in general, but also Jorita in particular for inviting me to give this talk. And I really forgot what was the exact title that I gave to Joita, but this is the title as it appears now on my screen. Can you see the title now? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so, let me then start the talk. It all started with an email. It was an email that I got on the 25th October of this year, 2021. It was a frenetic email. And it was from an ex-student of mine. Even if I don't tell you the name, you will be able to guess very easily who I'm talking about. All I can tell is that she is now a professor at a, a very respected college. And from her message, I learned that she's also the head of the physics department at the moment. And in fact, she had sent the message in her capacity as the head. So there was an introductory paragraph, which basically gave me all this information. And then there was the important part of the message, which was like this. We are planning to organize a webinar on the occasion of centenary year of the Nobel Prize to Einstein. We shall consider ourselves privileged. I forget about that sentence is not important. We want to arrange the webinar in the year 2021, date 
will be finalized according to your convenience. I already said that it was a frenetic email, but I have to explain what do I mean by an email being frenetic? It is not really clear how to detect freneticity in a written document. When one talks, the emotions come out through the pitch and the speed of the words delivered. Written words have no representation of either of those qualities. However, in this case, the signature was unmistakable. It was in this sentence, we want to arrange the webinar in the year 2021. Although it was not said explicitly, it would not be unreasonable to guess that the reason for the hurry is the occasion. As mentioned in the message itself, centenary year of the Nobel Prize to Einstein. But there was no cause for hurry. Einstein did not obtain his Nobel Prize in 1921. So one can debate which year would be the real centenary for the event, or even whether there was an event at all. And I know you are wondering what I'm talking about really. So let me say without beating around the bush that Einstein did not get his Nobel prize in the year 1921. So what are we doing here? Okay, Nobel Prize for physics is usually announced in October. The preparation for the choice starts the year before that. So for example, for the 2015 Nobel Prize, let's say, the first step was taken in September of 2014. At that time, letters and messages were sent by a five or six member Nobel committee to a lot of luminaries asking for their suggestions for the next year's prize. The deadline for submitting suggestions is the end of the month of January of the year of the award. So if I take the 2015 as the, as the number uh, to give an example. So 2014, the requests went out, 2014 September and 2015 January end or February beginning, they would come back to the committee. So, a few months then go by while the committee deliberates and also consults with experts outside the committee. Then in June or July, the committee prepares a report. It includes the names of the persons considered for the prize. Obviously there would be more than one person uh, whose name had appeared in the deliberations, some account of the proceedings and a recommendation for the recipient or the recipients based on everything. This report is submitted to the Royal Swedish Academy. The Academy makes the final decision on the basis of majority votes. This decision may or may not uphold the recommendation of the committee. And it has happened in the history of Nobel Prize when it was not upheld. But once the decision has been made by the Academy, this is final. The would-be recipient is announced in October and the prize is awarded in a ceremony at the Royal Swedish Academy held on the 10th of December.
Now, based on this timeline, one would conclude that Einstein, the recipient of the 1921 Nobel Prize for Physics, came to know about the decision in October 1921 and received the prize in December of the same year. No, that did not happen at all. But we must go back a few years before coming back to that part of the story. Some of Einstein's phenomenal work appeared in 1905. That year, in fact, is often called the Anum Mirabilis or the miracle year for Einstein. He submitted at least five papers in that year, all of which have become classic. And wonder of wonder, he did all the work at a time when he did not have an academic position. Of course, he applied for positions earlier, but was denied. Then in 1902, he accepted a position as technical expert third class at the patent office in Bern. During the Anam Mirabilis, he was still working there. I will not get into a history of how his work was received in the scientific community. I will only mention that the recognition was not instantaneous. Even in 1907, two years after the Anam Mirabilis, when he applied for a position at the University of Bern, his application was rejected. He did not get an academic position until 1908 and did not attend any academic conference until 1909. <clears throat> At 1909, he was 30 years old. So it was really strange that he did not attend a conference until at the age of 30. And the position that he obtained in 1908 was not even a permanent one. His first permanent position, academic position, was at the University of Prague, where he moved in 1911. Then in 1912, he was offered a professorship at ETH Zurich. ETH is the technical university. Uh, I'm probably not a good person to say the name in full because I am not good in German. Uh, so he, he, offer, uh, he was offered a, a professorship at the ETH Zurich, uh, which he accepted and moved back to Switzerland. Soon after, he was approached by people from Berlin with the idea of a membership at the Prussian Academy of Sciences. He accepted the position in December 1913 and moved to Berlin on the 6th of April 1914. Now, during all these turbulent years, his name started appearing in the Nobel nominations. In fact, with the exceptions of the years 1911 and 1915, he was nominated for the Nobel Physics Prize every year from 1910 to 1922. And the number 1922 should surprise you because he actually got the Nobel Prize for 1921. Now, in 1910, there was just one person who proposed Einstein's name. This person was Wilhelm Ostwald, winner of the 1909 Chemistry Nobel Prize, who earlier in 1901 turned down Einstein's application for an assistantship 
in his research, research group. Now, in 1912 and 1913, I already said 1911, he was not nominated. 1912 and 1913, Oswald was joined by several others, including some other Nobel laureates. All these nominations were for his theory of special relativity. Although some experimental confirmation of Einstein's now famous mass energy relation, E equal to mc square, started appearing in 1908, even in 1913, it was argued that the evidences were not compelling enough to merit a prize for the theory. Some other confirmation of the theory appeared later, 1916 onward. But by then, Einstein had published his general theory of relativity and the tables had turned. In fact, in 1916, he was nominated for his general theory of relativity, not the special relativity. And also in one of the nominations, there was a mention of his work on Brownian motion, which demonstrated the existence of molecules. But there was only one which mentioned Brownian motion. So let's jump cut to 1921. By then, Einstein had become a household name. I mean, this is not an exaggeration, you know. Indeed, his fame spread much beyond the circle of physicists even to lay people not directly involved with science. Because of the experiments performed by Arthur Eddington in 1919, which proved that the path of light is bent by gravitation in agreement with the prediction made in Einstein's general theory of relativity. In 1920, the nominations favoring Einstein talked mainly about the general theory of relativity, as might be expected. Now for the 1921 prize, there was a strong note from Max Planck, who had won the prize in 1918. And Planck nominated Einstein for general theory of relativity. It was a repeat of the request he had made the earlier year. And Carl Osen, a theoretical physicist from the University of Uppsala, proposed Einstein's name for the photoelectric effect. The committee the Nobel Committee requested its member, Olver Gullstrand, to prepare a report on the theory of relativity. And another member, Swant Arrhenius, a report of the photoelectric effect. Now, both of them were celebrated scientists. Gullstrand was a professor of ophthalmology who had worked on the geometrical optics of the human eye and won the 1911 prize for physiology and medicine for his contribution in this field. And his report on relativity was highly critical of the theory. He surmised that the effects of relativity would be unmeasurable. In quote, so small that in general, they lie below the limits of experimental error. On the other side, Arrhenius, who was the Nobel Prize winner for chemistry in 1909, <laughs> said, 
that since Planck had been awarded the Nobel for quantum theory as recently as in 1918, another prize should not go in the same direction so soon. So near the end of the year 1921, the Nobel committee decided that they could not find anyone suitable for the prize for that year. This year, 2021, is the centenary of that decision. In 1922, his name was proposed again, as I pointed out earlier. Now, meanwhile, the campaign for him has increased in strength. Maurice Brillouin. Now, for the physics people, I should tell that this is not the person who is responsible for the idea of Brillouin zone. This is another Brillouin, but also a famous physicist and mathematician. He wrote in quote, imagine for a moment what the general opinion will be 50 years from now if the name Einstein does not appear on the list of Nobel laureates, end of quote. Osen repeated his nomination for the photoelectric effect. Planck proposed to give the overdue 1921 prize to Einstein and the 1922 prize to Niels Bohr. This was indeed possible to give an overdue prize. Because according to the Nobel Foundation statutes, when no acceptable candidate can be found, the Nobel Prize can be reserved until the following year. So the committee again asked Gulstrand for a report on relativity. And Gulstrand reiterated what he had written the year before. Hossein was asked as well to produce a report on photoelectric effect, and he gave an excellent account of Einstein's revolutionary contributions to its theory. The committee recommended Einstein for the 1921 prize for photoelectric effect and Niels Bohr for the 1922 prize, just as Planck had suggested. And the Swedish Academy upheld the decision. Accordingly, a telegram was delivered to Einstein's address in Berlin on the 10th of November, 1922, informing him of the good news. Now, you might have started to think that the rest of the story would be obvious. That therefore Einstein went to Stockholm in the December of 1922 and received his prize, the Nobel Physics Prize for the year 1921. Wrong. That's not what had happened. Einstein was not home when the telegram arrived. He and his wife, Elsa, were on board a ship to Japan. He would not be back until March of 1923. So obviously, now we can see that he did not go to Stockholm to receive his prize in December of 1922. And pretty sure Einstein would not have looked at it as a lost opportunity. In fact, during the last few years, he was really quite sure that he would receive the Nobel Prize at some point. When he got divorced from his first wife, Mileva Marich, in January 1919, he promised her that he would give her the entire Nobel Prize money, whenever he would get it. So 
Of course, the news of Nobel Prize did not come as a surprise to Einstein. Indeed, in September of 1922, the 1914 Nobel Prize winner, Max von Laue, wrote a letter to Einstein telling him that it would be, within quotes, desirable for you to be present in Europe in December. End of quote. Now, when I say in quote, of course, these things were not written in English. It was a letter from a German speaker to a German speaker. But this is, a, I have taken it from a reasonable English translation. Now, Laue knew about Einstein's plan for visiting Japan. And he advised Einstein not to go. Of course, he did not mention the Nobel Prize. He could not. But the hint was rather obvious. Einstein ignored Laue's suggestion. It may also be true that he wanted badly to get out of Germany at that time. On 24th of June, 1922, Walter Rathnow, a politician and Einstein's friend was assassinated. There were attempts at the lives of several other people which were clear signs of rising anti-Semitism in Germany. So maybe he did not want to be in Germany. Anyway, the news must have reached him during his journey. It is not clear when that happened. There was no mention of the arrival of the news in Einstein's diary. So it was clear much before December that Einstein would not be around to accept his prize. The question then arose, who would receive it? on his behalf. Usually, when a recipient is absent for some reason, the person who represents him or her at the ceremony is the ambassador of the recipient's native country to Sweden, residing in Stockholm. So now, a battle of sorts ensued. What was Einstein's native country? Einstein was born in Germany in 1879 in the southern town of Ulm. So he must have been a German citizen by birth. But he moved with his family first to Italy in 1894 and then to Switzerland in 1895. In 1896, he paid three marks to obtain a document that proclaimed that he was not a German citizen anymore. He remained stateless for the next five years. Stateless means he did not belong to any country. He was not citizen of any country. He was residing in Switzerland. He applied for a Swiss citizenship in 1899 and got it in 1901. At the time when the Nobel Prize was announced for him, he was traveling with his Swiss passport. Clearly then, it should have been the Swiss ambassador to Stockholm who should have accepted the prize for him. But by now you know, this is a story where nothing goes according to the, according to the expectation. The information about Einstein's passport was known to the German foreign office, who passed it on to the German ambassador in Sweden. Rudolf Nadolny. Nadolny refused to believe it. He refused to believe that Einstein was not a German. And actually, he cannot be blamed for that. 
In 1922, Einstein was in Berlin, a member of the Prussian Academy of Sciences. The position was available only to German citizens. So when Nadolny telegraphed to the Academy, inquiring about the citizenship, the Academy replied <laughs> what it knew and believed that Einstein was indeed a German. Not only showed the reply to the Swiss ambassador. He was surprised, probably even unhappy, but he accepted the situation. He thought that probably since Einstein had been living in Berlin for a while, he considered himself to be a German again. Not only also graciously stated that Einstein's Swiss connection should be duly mentioned in public statements of any kind, and that the Swiss ambassador be also invited to the ceremony and to the banquet afterwards. In any case, it was Nadolny who accepted the prize on behalf of Einstein in December 1922. And in the Nobel records, he appeared as a German. The matter did not end there. The German Ministry of Science asked the Berlin Academy to clear up the citizenship issue. The Academy sent, the, the Academy sent its report on 23rd of January of 1923. They said that since the job at the academy required a German citizenship and Einstein had accepted the job, it could be concluded that he was a German. Now, remember that Einstein was away in Japan when all these things were going on. When he returned in March 1923, he was asked to give his view on the matter. His letter, dated 24th of March 1923, contained the following lines, which you now see on your screen. When my appointment to the academy was being considered, that is the Prussian Academy, my colleague Haber informed me that my appointment would result in my becoming a Prussian citizen. Prussia was the name of Germany. As I attached importance to retaining my nationality, he mentioned the Swiss nationality. So he attached importance to retaining his Swiss nationality. So Einstein writes, I made acceptance of a possible appointment dependent on this, a stipulation which was agreed to. So according to Einstein, he said that he wanted to remain a Swiss citizen and the academy agreed to that. It was clear that Einstein remained a Swiss citizen at heart. So when it came to the issue of handing over the Nobel Prize to him, he preferred that it be done by the Swiss ambassador to Germany. In fact, on 6th of April, 1923, Einstein's stepdaughter, Ilse, wrote a letter to the Nobel Foundation informing that Professor Einstein would, appre would appreciate if the medal and the diploma could be sent to him in Berlin <coughs> and added that it is preferred that this is done through diplomatic channels and in court, the Swiss embassy should be considered since Professor Einstein is a Swiss citizen, end of quote. So to end all the trouble, finally, 
the Swedish ambassador to Germany, Baron Rommel, handed the prize over to Einstein in Berlin. So to summarize, if we were to celebrate the centenary of the Nobel Prize announcement or the formal presentation of the award, that would be in 2022. If we want to celebrate the centenary of Einstein actually receiving the prize, that should happen in 2023. That's what I meant when at the beginning I said there was no cause for hurry. But there are a few things about the prize which have not been covered yet. First, what happened to the money? As I have already mentioned, Einstein promised his first wife, Mileva, at the time of their divorce in January 1919, that she would receive the entire Nobel Prize money. Einstein kept up to his promise. Soon after he got the money, in 1923, he transferred the entire amount to the bank account of Mileva. Mileva bought a house in Zurich, which she had wanted to buy for a long time. So Albert Einstein himself did not enjoy a penny of his Nobel Prize. The other thing which has not been discussed yet is the Nobel lecture. A Nobel Prize winner is supposed to give a Nobel lecture at the time when the prize is conferred on the work cited in the award. In Einstein's case, he was absent at the ceremony in December of 1922. After he came back to Europe, in March 1923, he received a letter from Swant Arrhenius, <coughs> whom I have mentioned before. And what I did not mention that he was also the director of the Nobel Institute and an esteemed member of the Nobel Committee. So Arrhenius uh, requested in his letter to Einstein that Einstein should visit Sweden at a time of his convenience. And he need not wait until the next Nobel ceremony, which would be held in December of 1923. So Einstein organized a trip to Sweden. On 11th July, 1923, he gave a lecture, not in Stockholm, in front of the Royal Swedish Academy, but to the Nordic Assembly of Naturalists at Göteborg. The audience consisted of about 2000 people, including the King of Sweden. Because of the lack of anything better, this lecture is considered to be his Nobel lecture ever since, not only unofficially, but even by the Nobel Prize Foundation. And it can be obtained on their website and printed in authorized collections of Nobel Prize lectures. But unlike usual Nobel lectures, this was not a lecture of the work that was cited in the award. The citation said that Einstein was receiving his prize for his services 
to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. There was no mention of relativity. There are good reasons to believe that the subject was deliberately omitted. Since in his nomination history, the reports on relativity were not really favorable. However, by an irony of fate, when Arrhenius invited him to Sweden, he left the choice of the topic to the speaker and added that something on his relativity theory would be a good choice. So, so Einstein gave his Gutenberg lecture on, the title is Fundamental Ideas and Problems of the Theory of Relativity. This is the title translated into English, of course. There was absolutely no reference to his own work on photoelectric effect, not even once. The Nobel Foundation had to accept it as the overdue Nobel lecture. All they could do is to add a comment that you see on your screen now, the lecture was not delivered on the occasion of the Nobel Prize Award and did not therefore concern the discovery of the photoelectric effect. This comment appears as a footnote in the found, foundation's website. It's a little bit incorrect because Einstein did not discover the photoelectric effect per se. He discovered a theory of the photoelectric effect. So, was relativity totally overlooked in Einstein's Nobel Prize? Well, certainly, as I said, the prize was not given for relativity. Even if one accepts the argument, however lame it might be, that there was not enough experimental evidence to support the theory in 1921 or 1922, the Swedish Academy could have considered him for a second Nobel for the theory of relativity at some later time. They did not. It is a pity that in 1921 or 1922 or even before that, there was no member in the committee who could evaluate relativity at that time. The reports submitted on relativity were negative. And certainly the prize could not be given on the basis of those reports. The Nobel committee probably began feeling that it would be an embarrassment if Einstein hadn't received the Nobel prize. So to quote Einstein's biographer, Abraham Pace, Osen's proposal to give the award from, for photoelectricity must have come as a relief of conflicting pressures, end of quote. However, it has to be said that relativity was not really completely omitted in the entire event. The presentation speech for the 1921 Nobel Prize was made by Swant Arrhenius he, from the no Nobel Committee. And he started his speech like this. There is probably no physicist living today whose name has become so widely known as that of Albert Einstein. Most discussion centers on his theory of relativity. This pertains essentially to epistemology and has therefore been the subject of lively debate in philosophical circles. It will be no secret that the famous philosopher Bergson 
in Paris has challenged this theory, while other philosophers have acclaimed it wholeheartedly. The theory in question also has astrophysical implications, which are being rigorously examined at the present time. So, Arrhenius admired relativity and recognized its importance. But it looks like he thought that it was essentially epistemology. The word, according to the Merriam Webster dictionary, means, and I quote, the study or a theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge, especially with reference to its limits and validity. End of quote. Maybe it was not possible to anticipate what role the theory would play in the coming decades in the discovery of new elementary particles, in the understanding of the behavior of heavy atoms, and in the birth and development of the theory of the universe as a whole. But from the presentation speech, it seems that the people in Nobel Foundation did not even realize that relativity was a theory of physics. They brought up Bergson's philosophical arguments in the context. Einstein liked and respected Bergson as a person. About his philosophy, he apparently commented, God fetishizes him, which maybe people, well, people who do not know German would not understand it. And I suspect that people who know German would not even understand it from my pronunciation. So the translation is, this is his comment about Bergson, God forgive him. Was Einstein hurt for no mention of relativity then or ever again in the circle of Nobel awards? Probably he did not care. The fame came to him anyway, with Nobel or without it. The money did not come to him with Nobel or without it. As for the prize itself, or in general about prizes, he was probably not a big enthusiast. A few incidents might throw light on his attitude. The Planck Medal is the highest award of the German Physical Society. It was instituted in 1929 and Einstein was the recipient of the inaugural year. The day of the award, he did some work in the morning and went to the house of his doctor friend, Janosch Plesch, for lunch. After lunch, he fell asleep on a couch. He got up at four. The ceremony was supposed to begin at five. Suddenly he realized that he might be asked to speak at the occasion. So he sat down at Plesha's table and grabbed the nearest piece of paper, which happened to be a bootmaker's bill. He scribbled on it for 20 minutes. Half an hour later, when Planck awarded the medal to him, he said in his acceptance speech that he knew that he would be overwhelmed after receiving the prize and would be at a loss for words. So he had written down his speech and he would read it out. And then he pulled the shoe bill from his waistcoat pocket and started reading. After the speech, Plesh told him that he needed the bill back. Einstein reached in his pocket 
pulled the bill and the medal that was also wrapped in it and gave the whole thing to Plesh. Plesh wrote in quotes, he never took it out. He never looked at it again. End of quote. In 1932, he was invited to become a member of a science academy. A form was sent to him to be filled out. It contained nine questions, including birth details, education, publication, and major scientific contributions. Einstein completed the form and submitted it. When it was submitted, the people in the academy found that there was no mention of his Nobel Prize. Certainly, Einstein did not consider it to be relevant to the answers to the questions asked. Well, so that's really the end of the story. How would have Einstein felt if he had known that there will be centenaries of his uh, getting of his uh, getting the Nobel Prize, he would not have cared. Just like he didn't care much about getting the Nobel Prize itself. And uh, therefore, as you see, that a lot of people get Nobel Prizes, but not everybody's Nobel Prize becomes a story. Einstein's Nobel Prize is a story in itself. And in fact, I want to really call it the incredibly strange story of Einstein's Nobel Prize. This is what I thought that should have been the title of my talk in keeping with, I mean, this is like the beautiful story by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You know, the name of the story is the incredible sad tale of innocent Erendira and her very cruel grandmother. So I think this story also deserves a name like that. And I end with that. Actually, I end with just one more slide just to show you where I have gotten the uh, material of this from. Of course, I haven't, I didn't uh, manufacture the material. I got it from three uh, um, biographies of Einstein, Abraham Pais, Banish Hoffman, and Ronald Clark. There is a, a nice uh, website which deals with what happened to the Einstein's prize money in detail. Uh, I forgot to put here that there are various things on the Nobel Prize Foundation website that I have consulted. I have mentioned them during the talk. When I started preparing the talk, I read a beautiful article by my colleague and friend, Gautam Gangopadhyay. And this is, the, uh, this is the talk, this is in Bengali. And then I also realized that in 2011, uh, I wrote a book in which many of these things uh, were discussed, but even I have forgotten them. So I'm sure that it will take you less time to forget all of this fantastic story, or maybe you couldn't. I was very surprised that the vice principal of this college mentioned my 2017 talk at the Scottish Church College, and I'm very, pleasantly surprised and grateful that he remembers that talk. And um, with that, I end my talk. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, sir. Now the question answer session. Uh, if any question from the audience, uh, you can raise hand or can write the question in the chat box. By the way, I have answered 
the two questions that vice. the vice principal posed to me yes. right fortunately yes. i had the answers to them in my talk if i didn't i couldn't have constructed the answer while giving the talk but fortunately uh, i had them so no questions from the audience so now the formal Rita, so may i have a question to our sir palas dami upen bolchi hmm bolo so ma ওই বাড়িটা কি সত্যি উনি কিনেছিলেন পরে ওই টাকা দিয়ে নোবেলের টাকা দিয়ে মিলেভা হ্যাঁ মিলেভা উনি কেনা কেনা হয়েছিল বাড়িটা মিলেভা বাড়িটা मींस देयर वाज अ हाउस व्हिच शी बॉट बट दिस वाज इन जुरिक ओके आइंस्टाइन आइंस्टाइन लिव्ड इन बर्न रिमेंबर किंतु ওই বাড়িতে কি আইনস্টাইন বোধ হয় আর জান নেই মনে হয় আইসন প্রবাবলি হি ডিড নট গো হ্যাঁ অলদো হি মেইনটেইনড more or less friendly relation with uh, mileva and sometimes discussed uh, their uh, children they had uh, i think two sons between them mm -hmm. and the, the, there was discussion about about their children between them but i don't think he went back to that house uh -huh. i i cannot be completely sure but uh, i'm sure the answer can be found in one of his biographies uh -huh. i also have read that uh, part written by gautam Uh, there is uh, no no mention at all regarding this whether gautam didn't that... uh, talk about the yeah, yes uh, what happened to the money yes okay <coughs> yeah i thought that maybe i should hmm. touch on that okay and one question is there from triash mukherji sir is it true that einstein have a conflict with philip lenard Einstein had what? Einstein have Priyash you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Conflict with Philip Leonard. Ah conflict with Philip Leonard. Yes. I really don't know. I don't know of any but that doesn't mean that he didn't have any. But uh, I don't know. Any other question? So I think no other questions are there. So now the formal vote of thanks. I request Dr. Shatodal Bhattacharjo to give the formal vote of thanks. like to explain my heartiest gratitude to our distinguished speaker professor palash purushan uh, uh, for his beautiful and interesting discourse on einstein nobel prize uh, professor pal has discussed several amazing and unusual historical events and linked with the award of nobel prize uh, we are really envious to your knowledge sir thank you very much a special thank to our respected principal dr modulan juri mondol uh, for inspiring and encouraging us to organize such events uh, for our students around the year thank you ma that i would also like to thank our vice principal professor shukrotin das for his support our principal and vice principal both this despite their busy program uh, try to attend almost all seminars organized in our department thank you ma'am thank you sir for your constant support i also extend my thanks to iqc coordinator for its collaboration and support i must thank our audience for attending the webinar and making it successful finally i thank our head of the department dr joita choudhury and all staff members including both teaching and not teaching of the department to make the program successful uh, thank finally thank you everyone everyone in, uh, involved with the program once again 
uh, for making the program a grand success. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we end here today. I don't know what he is. Mm -hmm.